describe to us your relationship with Dick Clark, because I think that bears on the context of this. Well, let's just take the first question. He said he gave you a plan. You said he didn't give you a plan. It's clear that what he did give you was a memo that had attached to it not only the Delenda plan, or whatever you want to describe Delenda as, but a December 2000 strategy paper. Was this something that you were supposed to act on, or was this a, a compilation of what had been pending at the time the Clinton administration had left office but had not been acted on? Or was this something he tried to get acted on by the Clinton administration and they didn't act on it? What was it? How did he describe it to you? What did you understand it to be? What I understood it to be was a series of um, decisions, near-term decisions that he had, were pending from the Clinton administration, things like uh, whether to arm the Uzbeks, I'm sorry, whether to, to give further counterterrorism support to the Uzbeks, whether to arm the Northern Alliance, a whole set of, uh, of specific issues that needed decision, and we made those decisions prior to the strategy being developed. He also uh, had attached the Delinda plan, which is my understanding was developed in 1998, never adopted, and in fact uh, had some ideas. I said, Dick, take the ideas that you've put in this think piece, take the ideas that, you've, that were there in the Delinda plan, put it together into a strategy not to roll back al-Qaeda, which had been the goal of the, uh, the Clinton, uh, of, the, of what Dick Clark wrote to us, but rather to eliminate this, uh, this threat. And he was to put that strategy together. Disruptions and renditions are important tools in the fight against terrorism and terrorist activity can be disrupted in many ways. Examples include watch lists to deny entry into the United States, liaison relationships with foreign intelligence, and law enforcement services willing to arrest and detain radicals, raids on terrorist facilities, and criminal investigations and prosecutions. In testimony given to the joint inquiry, the Director of Central Intelligence, George Tenet, summed up the ultimate disruption of al-Qaeda operations, destruction of the Afghani sanctuary. Quote, in this struggle, we must play offense as well as defense. The move into the Afghanistan sanctuary was essential. We have disrupted the terrorist plans, denied them the comfort of their bases and training facilities, and the confidence that they can mount and remount attacks without fear of serious retribution, end quote. Disruption became increasingly important in the years before September 11th. Following the arrest of Ahmed Rassam with explosives at the U.S. Canada border, and the discovery of plots in Jordan during the Millennium Celebrations. A worldwide effort was launched to thwart other attacks. The effort involved dozens of foreign intelligence services which detained suspected radicals minimally to keep off the streets, but also in the hopes of gaining confessions or intimidating them into absorbing planned attacks from happening. Former National Security Advisor Sandy Berger gave some ideas of the scope of these disruption efforts when he testified that the intelligence community had worked around the world since 1997 to dismantle al-Qaeda in about 20 countries. A rendition is the arrest and detention of terrorist operatives for return to the United States or into the country for prosecution. Renditions often lead to confessions, and they disrupt terrorist plots by shattering cells and removing key individuals. Practiced. Almost all renditions entail disruptions. I'm going to stop the chapter reading there. I had my own thoughts a little bit because the rendition and torture program implemented after September 11th certainly did disrupt cells, but it also gained false confessions. In other words, let's use Khalid Sheikh Mohammed as the example. Khalid Sheikh Mohammed is the alleged mastermind of the 9-11 attacks. When he was captured in Pakistan in 2003, he was um, sent to CIA black sites overseas. He was tortured and waterboarded 183 times. So let's say that he gave up plots. True actual plots by al-Qaeda, bin Laden, and masterminded by himself. 
But he also added false plots, which is true, which is not. Well, we don't know. That information is classified. But nevertheless, no matter what he says here, it doesn't matter. Because even if he was a mastermind of a plot, he said this under duress of torture. He was coerced through threats of his family to himself. And thus created this quagmire that we have in Guantanamo Bay currently regarding no trial. One of the Guantanamo Five that are charged with the September 11 attacks providing uh, logistical or operational planning was Ramzi bin al-Shib, who was captured before Khalid Sheikh Mohammed in Pakistan. He is now deemed mentally incompetent to stand trial because of the torture that he received. Now, who's to say in the future the other four won't be deemed mentally incompetent because they are most likely uh, just as competent or worse? Incompetent. Back to the chapter reading. Working with a wide array of foreign governments, CIA and FBI helped deliver dozens of suspected terrorists to justice. Counterterrorism center officers disrupted operations. And they also were responsible for the renditions program and told the joint inquiry that from 1987 to September 11, 2001, the CIA's counterterrorism center was involved in the rendition of several dozen terrorists, a number that increased substantially after September 11th. Former National Counterterrorism Coordinator Richard Clark described for the Joint Inquiry a particularly successful program, through which we were able to identify al-Qaeda members throughout the world. The emphasis on renditions and disruptions increased as the intelligence community received more frequent reports of impending al-Qaeda attacks in the spring and summer of 2001. As the Director of Central Intelligence, George Tennant testified before the Joint Inquiry, quote, starting in the spring and continuing through the summer of 2001, we saw a significant increase in the level of threat reporting. Again, working with the FBI and foreign liaison services, we thwarted attacks on the U.S. Embassy in Paris, our embassy in Yemen, U.S. facilities in Saudi Arabia, and operations to kidnap U.S. citizens. We approached 20 countries with specific targets for disruption, prompting arrests in redaction and elsewhere. End quote. Between 1996 and September 2001, the United States worked with dozens of foreign governments to disrupt al-Qaeda, arrest and interrogate its operatives, and prevent terrorist attacks. Throughout that period, Afghanistan was a terrorist safe haven, in which al-Qaeda built a network of planning attacks, training and vetting recruits, and indoctrinating potential radicals. In essence, al-Qaeda created a terrorist army in Afghanistan with little interference. As the Director of Central Intelligence explained in testimony before the Joint Inquiry, the terrorist plotting, planning, recruiting, and training in the late 1990s were aided immeasurably by the sanctuary the Taliban provided. One, Afghanistan has served as a place of refuge for international terrorists since the 1980s. The Taliban actively aided bin Laden by assigning him guards for security, permitting him to build and maintain terrorist camps, and refusing to cooperate with efforts by the international community to extradite him. Two, in return, bin Laden invested vast amounts of money in Taliban projects and provided hundreds of well-trained fighters to help the Taliban consolidate and expand their control of the territory. Three, while we often talk of two trends in terrorism, state-supported and independent, in bin Laden's case the Taliban, what we had was something completely new, a terrorist sponsoring a state. Now, let me stop the chapter reading and add my own thoughts to this. The Taliban had, this is assuming that the Taliban knew about the planes attacks. Now, from what we know from the public record and from the Taliban itself, now take this with a grain of salt, that they were not aware of the planes operation. I happen to believe this, and I'll tell you why. Taliban were fighting the Northern Alliance and the Uzbeks for control of the north of Afghanistan to take over the country. If they had participated in the planes operation or knew about it, 
This would invite the full force of the U.S. government and coalition partners, thereby defeating the stated goal, which is to take over the country. When September 11th happened, the Taliban went on TV and it was the first people to be interviewed. Taliban spokesman went on CNN. It was televised on CNN and C and C-SPAN regarding their intentions to hand over bin Laden had the Americans had any evidence of his involvement. And that's when U.S. President said, U.S. President George Bush said, we don't negotiate with terrorists. Thus, the evidence against bin Laden is not known because we don't know fully. We know little parts, but we don't know fully whether bin Laden was involved with the terrorist 11, September 11 terrorist operations. I believe he was, but I think it was through the selection of the pilots. Maybe. We don't know for sure. Information is either classified or doesn't exist. So we are left to a whim. So what DCI tended, George Tennant George Ten is saying here is a lot of assumptions. Unless he has information that we cannot see. Back to the chapter reading. Some CIA analysts and operators told Joint Inquiry staff that they recognized as early as 1997 that bin Laden's terrorist organization would continue to train cadres of Islamic extremists and generate numerous terrorist operations as long as the Taliban granted al-Qaeda sanctuary in Afghanistan. Failure to eliminate Afghanistan as a terrorist sanctuary had practical operational consequences. In describing to the Joint Inquiry, the CIA's 1999 plan to capture and bring bin Laden and his principal lieutenants to justice, the Director of Central Intelligence, George Tenet, explained, because U.S. policy stepped short of replacing the Taliban regime, the ability of the U.S. government to exert pressure on bin Laden was seriously limited. Because our government had no official presence in Afghanistan, the relations with the Taliban were seriously strained. The Director of Central Intelligence asserted it became much more difficult to gain access to bin Laden and al-Qaeda personnel. Between 1999 and 2001, the government did undertake some efforts to address the problem of Afghanistan as a terrorist sanctuary. In 1999, senior CIA and State Department officials began to focus on the Taliban as an integral part of the terrorist problem. In 1999 and 2000, State Department worked with the United Nations Security Council to obtain resolutions rebuking the Taliban for harboring bin Laden and allowing terrorist training. The Defense Department began to focus on the issue in late 2000 after the coal bombing that formulated military options for dealing with the Taliban. According to Steve Hadley, President Bush's Deputy National Security Advisor, the Bush administration initiated shortly after taking office a senior-level review of al-Qaeda policy. In summer of 2001, the State Department sent a demarche to Taliban representatives in Pakistan, which noted threats to Americans emanating from Afghanistan and declared that the United States would hold the regime responsible for actions by terrorists the Taliban harbored. None of these actions appear to have restrained terrorist training or al-Qaeda's ability to operate in Afghanistan. Despite the intelligence community's growing recognition that Afghanistan was churning out thousands of radicals. The Joint Inquiry found little effort to integrate the instruments of national power, diplomatic intelligence, economic and military, to address the problem effectively. Little effort was made to use the full force of the U.S. military before September 11th, with the exception of August 1998, with the cruise missile strikes. Former National Security Advisor Sandy Berger testified that there were little public or congressional support for an invasion of Afghanistan before September 11th. Permitting the sanctuary in Afghanistan to exist, allowing bin Laden's key operatives to meet, plan, train recruits, and ensure that al-Qaeda's masterminds remain beyond the reach of international justice. In testimony before the Joint Inquiry, the DCI of CIA, George Tenet, explained, quote, Nothing did more for our ability to combat terrorism than the president's decision to send us into the terrorist sanctuary. By going in massively, we were able to change the rules for the terrorists. Now they are the hunted. Now they have to spend most of their time worrying about their survival. Al-Qaeda must never again require a sanctuary, end quote. In response to a question about what he would have done differently in hindsight before September 11th, DCI Tenet reiterated the point about sanctuary. Quote, we should have taken down that sanctuary a lot sooner. 
circumstances at the time may have not warranted. The regional situation may have been different. And after 9-11, all I could tell you is that we let the sanctuary fester. We let bin Laden build capability. There have been lots of good reasons why, in hindsight, it couldn't have been done earlier or sooner. I am not challenging it, because hindsight is always perfect. But we let him operate with impunity for a long time without pulling the full force and muscle of the United States against it. And, quote. 